Today with Joseph Prince. Even his corrections become encouragements when you know the heart of Jesus. So when he says, oh, you of little faith, he's literally saying, why do you take so little from me when I am so full, I am so abundant? Why do you take so little? Jesus gave God, if you would, a righteous outlet for all his blessings to come upon sinful men. Amen. And the only thing that is holding it back is our worry. You probably have an experience where you had a pain in your side or whatever, and then uh, for, for some particular reason, you didn't worry about it. Two, three days later, you say, hey, wait a minute, a few days ago, I had this pain, and where is it now? It's gone. But there were other times you felt a pain, you start pressing, you start wondering, you start looking up your medical encyclopedia, <laughs> you start looking on the internet, you know, you start looking at all the symptoms, and then the pain became stronger. And for some, <laughs> have you ever had that experience before? Come on, am I the only one? <laughs> and perhaps, you know, God is supplying you. Like, I remember when I was a teenager, I, I never really worried about money. That was because I remember as a, as a college student, um, I only had this much money allowance to go by, and I remember that I was down to my last $10. And I found out that my older brother had a financial need. So unbeknownst to him, what I did was that I took my $10, my last $10, and I put it into his wallet. Now, he never knew about it, but you know what happened? That particular day, somebody would just bring me out for a meal. Things would just happen. And from then on, I, I realized that I never have to worry about money. So money, one area that I don't worry about is money. And it seems like for that area, supply is flowing. Amen. You know, when, when it was presented to me as a pastor because of our growing congregation to get a, a, a bigger place, in Singapore, property is very expensive because land is scarce. And now we have built a, a building that costs four hundred million US and it's all fully paid and I'm telling you when I look back to God be all the glory when I look back and I think to myself how did we do it until now I have no answer you know we have miracle seat Sundays where we raise a special Sunday we raise money for the building out of five years we only had four miracle seat Sundays and one particular year you know my leaders were telling me pastor it's about time for us and I said I don't feel the leading this year I just don't worry about it. And money came in. To God be the glory. Now, you might think there were many $1 million gifts. No, there's only one in all that five years. Only one check of a million dollars. It's the five loaves and two fish. <laughs> so when someone asks me, how do you do it? I don't know. <laughs> I just let go, brother, chill, hey, amen. <laughs> Live the let go life. So this book is different from many other books on stress, worry, and anxiety in that many times they tell you what to do. Breathe harder, breathe deeper, push. <laughs> you know, they, they tell you steps and all. Okay. No, I'm not against all that. In fact, there is a place where the Bible talks about deep breathing, and I mentioned that in my, in my book. But uh, God's way is not to do more but to look at all the, the knots in your life, find out where the knots are, what are you worried about, and learn to cast your care in that area to the Lord. Amen. Parenting especially was, was the, the, the point where I squeezed that golden pipe a lot. The revelation that Joseph Prince preaches about communion has just completely revolutioned my life. And as I see Jesus on that cross, he doesn't have rheumatoid arthritis, neither do I. I feel so good to be pain free. Every day was so painful until I got freedom. If the gospel of grace has impacted your life, I would like to invite you to join us as a grace legacy builder. Let's advance the gospel of grace together. Visit the link on your screen to be part of leaving a legacy of grace today. You know, I thought I was a cool guy. I was a carefree man, you know, and, and until I got married. And then the baby came, Jessica came along. Every little sneeze, every little cough, every little, you know, it's like, I'm asking Wendy, is the room too cold, you know? Is she coming down with something, is she okay? I know some of you guys are not worried about that, but for some reason, because of my love for my daughter, you know, you find that the devil knows how to bring worry and care, especially for people that love 
someone else. It seems hard to let go of worry and anxiety when you love that person. Yet, the most responsible thing you can do for that person, I'm coming to the story, let me just tell you what happened. And, and, and we, we are going to the doctor, bring Jessica in and out, in and out, and uh, as a little baby, you know, saw her getting all kinds of shots and all that. And, and it seems like the more I worry about her, the more she had all these conditions. And one day I had to go to God, I need an answer, Lord, speak to me, Lord, what's going on? And the Lord says, you know, son, every time you worry about your daughter, it's like having a big button right over her, her head that the devil can push anytime. And when he pushes it, your preaching for that Sunday is affected. When he pushes it, your relationship with Wendy is affected. So you're giving her a button. So what do I do, Lord? Surrender her to me. Amen. And when things happen, just say, I'm not worried about that. It's in the Lord's hands. No, I'm not worried about it. It's in the Lord's hands. The devil will come to you after you cast your cares. Make it business-like. Make it like a business transaction. Mark it down. Today, at 2.35, I knelt down and I gave God, write down, number one, worry, all right? Your daughter's name, your son's name, okay, your finance, whatever it is, write it down and say, Lord, and crush it into a piece of paper, whatever. Lord, here you, you are. I surrender to you. Remember that time, write it down somewhere, and once you let go, honor him by not taking it back in your thought life. What's gonna happen? The devil will come to you and say, what are you going to do about that? What are you, me? Check it with him. What are you going to do about your daughter? What are you going to do about that the dateline? What are you going to do about that payment? What are you, you, you? The law focuses on you. You shall not, you shall not, you shall not. Grace focuses on God. I will, I will, I will be merciful to their sins and their sins and iniquities will I remember, will I remember no more. It's all about God and His supply. The focus, the devil wants to put a focus on you. The Lord wants your focus on Him. So once you cast that care to Him, don't take it back in your thought life. There'll be a temptation. There'll be a challenge. But don't touch it. Don't take it. Can I be good? Amen. amen. And I noticed she got stronger. She got more blessed. Amen. So with every new challenge, we find that... Now, by the way, some of you looking down there, Pastor Prince, you're just too worried about your daughter. I'm really sure. Now, But you might have another area of worry. You might have another area of anxiety that I'm not worried about. Maybe finances to you is something, you know, that you think about often. We all have our cares and our worries in certain areas. But God wants you carefree. What are you saying, Pastor Prince? It sounds so irresponsible. Let go and the supply will flow. Yes. <laughs> Read my lips. Yes. <laughs> that, that's so irresponsible. You know what is irresponsibility? You trying to take do it with your puny hands. You know what's the greatest responsible and the most powerful thing you can do? Let it go into the hands of God Almighty who move heavens and earth. Amen? A God who loves you. That's the most responsible thing you can do. We gotta think, you know, the devil wants us to make, make us feel that we are irresponsible when we are carefree, when we let go, when actually it's the greatest responsibility that you can do. Amen? Amen? Then Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Now, I'm not talking about loafers here. He's talking about, about people who just don't work. And the Bible says, if any will not work, neither should he eat. <laughs> He's talking about living a carefree life, a stress-free life. And look at the birds of the air, he says. God feeds them. Have you noticed, even walking by the concrete road here in Houston, birds are feeding off the concrete. You can't even see the food, and they are packing away. Then Jesus looked at all of his people at that time and says, are you not of more value than the birds? And he goes on to say, and why worry about your clothing? Now, is it really clothing he's talking about? No, he's going deeper. Your health, quality body, don't forget. It's not the body more than clothing. And he says that, look at the lilies of the field. Look at the lilies of the field. This is from Israel, exactly at the spot where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. And these are the descendants of that lilies. Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. Focus how. The focus on how they grow. They toil not. That's for the men folk. They spin not. Those are for the ladies. 
And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon, the wealthiest man in history, and probably still to date, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of this. In what way, pray tell me, in what way, Lord, as I'm meditating on this, I ask the Lord, in what, tell me in what way is one tiny lily better clothed than Solomon in all his glory? And the Lord showed me that Solomon had to get his clothing from the outside in. The lily produces its clothing from the inside out, which means the lily's clothing is its body. It is its body, right? I, if I tell you, remove the clothing of the lily, you cannot do that because the lily's clothing is its body. It's its health, and its health springs from within. That's what the Lord is talking about, people. Which of you, by taking an anxious thought, can add to your lifespan? The word there in the Greek can be your lifespan, can be your height. Pastor Prince, today I'm a seven-footer. You should see me back then when I was only four feet. I couldn't grow. Medically impossible. You know how I got to be like this, seven-footer today? Worrying. <laughs> Worrying. I took time to worry, man. Every year I worried one feet taller. <laughs> so Jesus must have a smile on his face. Which of you, by taking an anxious thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And even this one little lily, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of this. Therefore, if God clothed the lilies of the field, don't forget, he's talking about health, healthy body. If God clothed the lilies of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Now watch this. If I let go, God will clothe me, amen, with our clothing as well, but talking about health, he will clothe me with health, and I'm better clothed than the lily of the field, because the lily is today here, gone tomorrow, amen? But the lily of the field is better clothed than Solomon in all his glory. So what's the point of having gorgeous clothes to put it on a sick body? It's not the body more than clothing. I want you to sit back and watch this testimony. And this is from a TBN series of a lady who got healed. Um, watching my program, let's have her share in her own words. I went for a regular doctor's checkup after my mammogram because five years earlier, I had an early detected case of breast cancer. During this routine exam, the doctor examining me said she had felt a lump. She then conducted an ultrasound on me, but because the skin wasn't very clear, she requested that I stick around to have another one done by the radiologist. I agreed, but also began speaking scriptures over the lump. I refused to give in to fear. As I was waiting, I received your Daily Grace Inspiration email entitled, Choose Not to Worry. The devotional encouraged me not to worry and quoted Matthew 6, verse 27. Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? There was also a testimony of a woman in your church who was diagnosed with lumps in her breast after a mammogram, but she believed that she was healed. She even wrote on her medical report that Jesus is her healer. And a subsequent ultrasound scan the very same day revealed no evidence of any lumps. I almost burst into tears because I knew that it was for me. I began to meditate on that scripture and several other healing scriptures. Even though I wanted to call my husband and friends to pray for me, I didn't because I felt that God was telling me to trust him. An hour later, the radiologist conducted the scan on me twice, but she was unable to find the lump. And I had to point out where it was. However, all she said was, I can't find anything. There's nothing on the film and I can't find anything. Yeah, praise the Lord. Isn't the Lord wonderful? Amen. You know, it's fine to confess the Word of God, but you can confess with anxiety. Amen? You can be saying, by his stripes I'm healed, and you are confessing, saying all the right things, but it's from a heart of anxiety. You are troubled. You know, the Hebrew word for healing is the word rafa. I love to study Hebrew words. And the word rafa 
is the word for healing. But do you know the etymology, the root word of Rafa? Do we have a word Rafa up here? The root word for Rafa is the word relax. Rafa. That's the etymology of the word Rafa, heal. Jehovah Rafa. Relaxed. The very first thing you've got to do is to let go. Let go. Find where the knots are and cast your cares in that area to the Lord. And then know that it's in the Lord's hands, the most loving one. You know what God says to cast your cares to Him? Very beautiful. For He cares for you. Because He cares for you. Because He cares for you. So don't just cast your cares, all right, without understanding He cares for you. He doesn't even want you to worry about the zit on your face. Not even the smallest thing. He wants you carefree because that's a life of faith. Amen? Amen. And the devil will try to make you feel guilty that you are, uh, after you cast your care, what are you going to do about this? How can you just sit down and do nothing? Amen? Now, we can still be doing things, but you'll be directed. Rest is not inactivity. Rest is spirit-directed activity. What needs to be known will be known. What needs to be revealed will be be revealed. And Jesus ended up by saying, don't worry about tomorrow. Live one day at a time. The manna comes from heaven one day at a time. And there were children of Israel who tried to store manna, right? They tried to store manna for one week. It it stank. It bred worms. So give us this day our monthly bread, (laughs) daily bread. There's only enough grace for one day. Amen. Don't, don't, don't leave tomorrow today. Amen. Don't, don't, you can plan, but don't plan with anxiety. Amen. There's only grace for today. When the day comes, you find the grace will be there. The grace will be there. Amen. He loves you. And he wants to restore everything that you have lost. There's one verse that I want to give you. Um, every time I pray about my sessions here in Lakewood, this verse keeps coming up, and I believe that the Lord wants you to have this verse. Look up here, it says, God wants, Deuteronomy 6 verse 11. God says, I'll bring you, He's gonna bring you to houses full of all good things, which you did not feel. So it's gonna be by rest, not by your efforts. And hewn out wells which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, which you did not fill, which you did not dig, which you did not plant. What is that? Live the let go life. He's going to present it to you and it's going to be a gift. And I believe that the days are coming. That literally, this are, I believe for many of you, literal houses. Amen. Literal wells. Literally filled with all good things. Amen. Even our Christian life. We step into this beautiful life, not by our efforts, through the work of another. We need to understand, people, that the Lord wants to serve you. I wonder if you realize how much He wants to give to you. You say, Pastor Prince, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I know. That is vertically, all right? Excuse me, horizontally. Horizontally, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Vertically, with God, it's more blessed to receive than to give. Because God will always take the place of the greater. The less is blessed by the greater. God always takes the place of the greater. He wants to take the place of the greater. Amen. He's the giver. Those who are loved best, who knows that they are loved by God, those who are loved best, love best. Those who are given to best, give best. Those who allow Him to serve them, they serve best. Come on, people. Amen. You know, even the Lord's indictments, when you think about it, He says, how much more will God clothe you, O you of little faith? Have you noticed that His favorite correction that He always uses on His disciples is always, O you of little faith. He never says, O you of little prayer. Oh, you of little church attendance. Oh, you of little Bible reading. Oh, you of little fasting, I can tell. (laughs) He never says that, right? 
It is always, always what? Oh, you of little faith. Can we stop the thing? Love is the hand that gives. Faith is the hand that takes. So when he says, oh, you of little faith, he's literally saying, why do you take so little from me when I am so full, I am so abundant? Why do you take so little from me? Why do you trust me so little? Why do you take so little? Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Why your cup? Bring the entire reservoir. Lord, fill it up, Lord. And he will still have plenty left over. Amen. Oh, you of little faith. So even his corrections become encouragements when you know the heart of Jesus. Allow him to give to you. Allow him. Every day say, Lord, I wonder what you have for me today. And just take the journey expecting, expecting. Now, you won't be a lazy Christian, trust me. No one was more busy than our Lord Jesus, and yet no one was more relaxed. Three and a half years, he accomplished all his life work. Three and a half years. And there's a story where, you know, in Mark chapter four and five, if you read the entire thing as a one narrative, you find him preaching the sower and the seed to the multitudes. Right after that, he went into the boat and he says to the disciples, let us go to the other side. And he fell asleep. He had his siesta, well deserved. He was tired. He fell asleep. As a man, he was tired. He fell asleep and there was a storm brewing, right? And the storm was hitting them hard and the disciples woke him up. Notice he didn't wake up because of the storm. He woke up because of the cry of the disciples. Amen. Jesus walked this earth and he says, son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And the word there is clean all. Foxes have holes and caves to live in. Birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to clean all his head, to rest his head. And the same word, which is seldom used in the New Testament, is used when he hung there on the cross. And the Bible says, he bowed his head. The word bowed there is clean all. He rested his head and dismissed his spirit. Now friends, that is power. Most people would die and their heads would bop down. That is helplessness. Jesus positioned himself for death. He rested himself. He finally found his rest in redeeming us, in loving us, in saving us. And he rested himself and like the king that he is, he dismissed his spirit. The Greek there is dismiss his spirit. And we are all saved. When that happened, all the claims of divine justice are fully met by his shed blood. The law has been magnified. God is glorified. And men blessed, saved, healed, <laughs> delivered. Amen. I wonder if you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ today. The Bible says, this life that we talk about, you know, you might say, I, I'm afraid if I let go, nothing will happen. Now, it's true for the people of the world, but not for the child of God. Amen. Underneath are the everlasting arms of God. When you let go, God takes hold. He told me many years ago, when you work, the Holy Spirit says, when you work, God rests. When you rest, God works. Amen. Amen. So friend, salvation. Forgiveness of sins is not something you do with your, your, your good deeds and your performance and your striving. No, salvation is received as a gift through the work of another. Just like God brings us to a land flowing with milk and honey, already prepared for us, God wants to bring you to that place of salvation. Amen. Where it all starts, this carefree, let go life starts by knowing Jesus as your Savior. If that is you, wherever you are, just pray this prayer with me right now. All across this auditorium and wherever you're watching this, remember, rest. Salvation starts by resting upon the work of another. Say this from your heart. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of your Son, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you that on that cross, 
He bore all my sins, died in my place, and rose again from the dead, having conquered death for me. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father. All my sins are forgiven. I am greatly blessed, highly favored, deeply loved. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. and welcome to the abundant life. Welcome to the let go life. Your sins are all forgiven. You are now a child of God. When you let go, God takes hold. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to Joseph Prince Ministries. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to receive all our latest videos. And join us this Sunday for church on Grace Revolution Church Online.